Hello, Hour of History regulars and newbies. Glad to have you along for this excellent conversation about the environment with Dr. Rebecca Bond. We talk about Louisiana, the disappearing coastline, and environmental interaction with politics and the economy. You're going to want to listen to every minute of today's podcast, which is brought to you by Audible. On Audible, you can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial while you support the Hour of History podcast. You just go to audibletrial.com forward slash hour of history. There you'll find over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can download a nice audiobook for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's at audibletrial.com forward slash hour of history. Thanks again for listening to Hour of History podcast. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, anyplace. With your host, Stephen Bauman, and producer, James Abel. The Hour of History is a member of Episodic Network, an association of fun, interesting, and informative podcasts. Episodicnetwork.com. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, and welcome to Hour of History. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week... Dr. Rebecca Bond is joining us to talk about the environment. How's it going, Rebecca? It's going pretty well, Stephen. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, I mean, there's no, like, great disaster in the environment that's happening in my world, so... The snow didn't count. I thought that was pretty catastrophic. (laughs) You know, snow, because I grew up in California, snow still has that, like, novelty feeling. (sighs) Uh, even, even like after a couple of days where it's like icy and annoying, I, I get that. But like Sunday was, were you able to go and like have an adventure in the snow? Because you're in the DC area too, right? Yeah, I'm in Northern Virginia. So I was, you're right. The first like couple of hours, it's sort of magical and exciting uh, before it like turns into hardened ice and it's dangerous to walk. <laughs> um, my biggest problem is my dogs don't like the snow so, oh no yeah it's been fun trying to get them to go outside and use the restroom so <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's and that's tough when it when it doesn't stop because we had a couple continuous days um so so tell me a little bit about your work i i was looking i was, my dream was to have you know i'm trying to get as many environmental historians on our history as possible because it's important and people need to hear about this stuff. And I came across your name and I saw that you had written about Louisiana. And, and so why don't we take it from there? What, what is your background? Yeah, that sounds great. And I, I applaud you for bringing more environmental historians on. Um, so we, I, uh, I wrote my dissertation at LSU. That's where I graduated from in 2016. Um, and, I, you know, the extent about which people know about what's going on in Louisiana sort of varies. Um, the state has lost about 1,800 square miles of, of land um, since the 1930s. Uh, and if you hear that number and you think, oh, that, that sounds like a lot, but you can't really visualize it, um, basically, if you, you know, sort of look at that, that time span of land and the loss, it equals to about a football field every hour. Um, so the state is losing lots of land, uh, it's losing lots of its wetlands, and that is creating all kinds of problems um, in Louisiana and really for the nation. Um, Louisiana is a huge um, part of our nation's infrastructure in terms of energy and also shipping and navigation. Um, And so having those wetlands disappear um, has uh, created a lot of problems. And another probably really memorable event in which coastal erosion played a role uh, was was Katrina um, and the devastation that happened in New Orleans um, because so many wetlands had been lost. Uh, those wetlands that had absorbed storm action and storm waves as the shore as the storm went on to shore, um, it wasn't there anymore. Uh, and so we saw that sort of devastation happen in uh, with Katrina in New Orleans. Yeah, so I, I love how you put that in uh, terms of a football field. As uh, someone who I did my undergraduate at Louisiana State, and uh, so I appreciate the football metaphor and, and so on, but that is horrifying. Yeah. 
It's, it's really scary um, to think about. And Louisiana has uh, something like 40% of the na nation's wetlands in the contigu contiguous United States are in Louisiana. Um, so it's a huge area and lots of biodiversity, uh, birds that winter, uh, you know, birds that fly south, they'll, they'll stop in Louisiana. When they come back from South America, they stop. Um, and they're islands that they would go and they, that they go and nest in. A lot of them have disappeared. Um, and so you have issues with, with birds and migratory patterns. And of course, if you like shrimp or oysters, um, those industries are threatened because of coastal erosion. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And the state has been working on trying to solve this problem um, since the early 1970s with um, somewhat mixed results. Uh, and of course, the federal government got involved in the 1990s. So that's what I wrote my dissertation on was that the policies of of coastal erosion and how the state and federal government have responded to it. Yeah, and that's absolutely fascinating. I'm I'm curious how does uh well I mean it, it maybe you could share a little bit with the listeners. Um, in Louisiana, you know the the wetlands are are a part of everyone's life to a certain extent. But particularly in your case, how did you you know come to a point where you wanted to spend a significant chunk of your life um, writing on them? Uh, so I actually got started, I was interested in uh, my master's program about energy and the impact of energy development on the environment. Um, and so I was looking around, you know, at different grad schools that I could go to for my doctorate. And, you know, what better place to go study the impact of energy development than Louisiana, right? Because it has so much oil and gas drilling. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I ended up at, at Louisiana State University. And um, as I was getting ready to do my dissertation and sort of looking at what the oil and gas industry had done in Louisiana, um, you know, it plays a big role in that story of coastal erosion and the loss of the wetlands. Um, and so that sort of transitioned into a broader examination of all of the things that have contributed to the loss of wetlands and also, again, you know, how the state and federal government have responded to it. Mm -hmm. So this is a story that's, you know, it's, it's deeply political and at the same time deeply economic and, and human to a relatable level for almost everyone. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the oil and gas industry has brought lots and lots of jobs to Louisiana. It's brought lots and lots of money to the state government. Um, and so, you know, people, they, they think about that industry and what it's done for them. Um, and then probably the biggest contributor to coastal erosion has been the engineering of the Mississippi River, um, putting levees up on the Mississippi, and that's changed the hydrology um, and the, the depositing of, of fresh water and sediments that go into building the wetlands. Um, and pretty much anyone who lives along the river, regardless of whether you're in Louisiana or not, you know, to some extent have benefited um, from the engineering of the river, but it's caused all kinds of environmental problems um, down in, in southeastern Louisiana and also in the western part of the state. Hmm. And now, now, are these always these sort of environmental stories like strike me as declension narratives, like no matter what happens, it's going to end terribly? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is, is, that, is that the case? Or do you find um, now you're looking at the 70s to, you know, this up, up to almost present day. Um, do you find more optimism than that in the way people view these kind of things like engineering the Mississippi? Or do people know that? we're kind of screwed. Uh, so I wish I had, I could be more positive. Um, <laughs> I try to be positive because um, there, there, there are a lot of really smart people in Louisiana trying to solve this problem. Um, and they're really passionate about it and they're really committed to, to solving it. Um, so I would like to be positive. Um, they've done lots of, of really cool things um, trying to rebuild the marshes. Um, but and this, this, this doesn't just play out in Louisiana. It plays out with lots and lots of other sort of environmental catastrophes in that inevitably you run up against the problem of cost. Um, and you also inevitably run up against the problem of who bears the consequences. Because um, if you're looking at, at restoration in Louisiana, um, trying to fix the marshes or at least um, create a smaller but sustainable coast, um, there are people who are going to lose out. Uh, and that's the case with any time you're, you're dealing with the environment. Uh, people will lose when the environment is degrading, and they're probably going to lose when there are efforts to fix it. I um, mean, we see that story play out over and over again. Um, so, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to fix Louisiana's coast, and Louisiana can't pay for it. Um, it's, it needs the federal government to help pay for it. Um, and, I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars uh, over the next 50 years. Um, and the money's just not there. 
uh, and I don't know that it will ever be there. Um, so I, you know, I'm sort of optimistic because there are so many smart people dealing with this issue, but um, the reality is it's extremely expensive and figuring out who is going to bear the, the sort of cultural and social costs of restoration, um, you know, because they can't save everything on the coast now, they're, we're going to have to retreat at some point. Um, and who does that, right? Whose community mm. gets sort of lost out? You know, who do we who do we save? Who do we not save? And those kinds of ethical questions and practical questions um, make it a less than sunny story. Yeah, it's, it's it is it's it's troubling questions that we sort of have to um, come in touch with. And but but it, until there's a big disaster, it seems like it's not it isn't a pressing issue. Did you find that? Um, it, it was it always an issue like going back to the 1970s um, tell us a little bit about that has it always been in front of people's minds where has it been in sort of the political landscape of Louisiana and the US uh, so that's a, that's a great question um, there are references to coastal erosion back to the 1920s um, and the loss of the wetlands and the way the wetlands were changing um, back into the early 20th century um, in the early 1970s, right, in the midst of this sort of environmental movement that's taking hold of the entire United States, um, people in Louisiana were really sort of paying attention to what was happening. Um, and the way that the, the loss of the wetlands sort of came to the forefront, this is one of my favorite stories about, about coastal erosion, um, the, the way that people started to recognize that this was a huge problem um, was in the, the late 1960s, the state of Texas had this crazy idea to divert part of the Mississippi River to western Texas to um, provide water for agriculture. Oh. Uh, yeah, then Louisiana learned about this and they started calling them the Texas water rustlers. Um, <laughs> and so they were they were not thrilled about it, uh, especially shrimpers and fishers um, in the in the coast. They knew that that was going to create problems for them. Um, and so this this researcher, um, a man by the name of Sherwood Gagliano was looking into it, right, sort of seeing what the feasibility of building this huge siphon off the Mississippi River was going to do. And as he was researching that, um, he was looking at aerial photographs. And over a long period of time, he, he started to see just how, how much land had disappeared. Um, and so he wrote a lot of news articles. He did a bunch of presentations in the, light, the late 1960s and early 70s telling people, you know, this is a huge problem. This is systemic. Um, first of all, diverting the Mississippi River is crazy. We can't do that. Um, and they, they, they had no idea how they were going to power this huge diversion, too. There were all kinds of crazy ideas about how they were going to power it. Um, but so he's, Gagliano is presenting this, and he's talking to people. Um, and in the early 1970s, 1972, the state actually put a commission together to sort of look at the problem. And um, they put out some reports in the early 70s. Uh, and so it was then, I think, in Louisiana where people really started to pay attention. Um, I don't know that it became sort of widespread, um, certainly not at the national level, into the early 1990s. Um, a man by the name of John Bro, who was Louisiana senator at the time, um, he started really pushing for the federal government to do something about coastal erosion in Louisiana. Um, so, but again, I think it sort of stayed off the radar of the national, um, national news until Katrina. I think that's what really put Louisiana's coastal erosion problem sort of on the national map to speak. Hmm. And it's interesting this this division between like uh, collective identity and and state uh, state individuality. I guess you could say because uh, he, here you have Texas, you know, sort of not worried about Louisiana. I guess they weren't worried about what diverting the river would do to Louisiana. Um, you know, I don't know that they fully understood, like, just I, – because I, Mississippi's so big, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's such a big river. It's so long. Um, it's it's such a, a wide river. So I don't know they fully understood that, you know, the amount of water that they were going to have to divert from the river to get it over to western Texas. I'm not sure. It was fully – they fully comprehend. It was just one of those, like, crazy infrastructure ideas, you know, that, that existed. Um, so I, I guess they didn't really think about it. Um, and, and after Louisiana said, you know, no, that it's absolutely not going to happen, um, Texas did look at other parts of the Mississippi, right, and like Missouri, where they might be able to divert um, from the river. So, yeah, you do have this sort of 
state individuality concerns about, you know, their needs. Um, and, of course, that's played out through American history, right, where states are concerned mm. about themselves. Um, and that doesn't work in the environment, right, because rivers yeah. don't care about state boundaries and, you know, the air doesn't care about state boundaries. So, um, but, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, great observation. And it seems like that um, sort of thing hasn't really gone away, though. Uh, I remember shortly after Katrina, like, not to get too far jumping around uh, chronologically, but after Katrina, people sort of talking about like, well, let's just move New Orleans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Abandon New Orleans and start somewhere else. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's like, it's, it's the same sort of idea, I guess. Like we're gonna, um, you know, just find a better place or change things because haven't there been talks about like, like, um, uh, moving the Mississippi so it doesn't empty out through, South Louisiana in the same spots? Yeah, so the Mississippi historically, you know, geologically, it switches tracks about every thousand years. Um, <laughs> um, so that's what makes the wetlands, that's what's made the, the wetlands. If you look at the map of Louisiana, which is a lie now at this point, but it has all these <laughs> sort of like beautiful tendrils of land going out into the Gulf of Mexico, um, that's been made by the Mississippi River sort of jumping channels. Um, so speaking of crazy engineering projects, um, in the 1950s and 1960s, um, there were concerns that the Mississippi was getting ready to jump channels eventually um, into the Atchafalaya uh, because water always sort of seeks the easiest route you know, down. Um, mm -hmm. And so more and more of the, the river had started to diverting into the Atchafalaya. Uh, and so in the 1960s, the Army Corps of Engineers built this huge structure um, just north of Baton Rouge, uh, called the Old River Control Structure. And basically what that structure did was a couple of different things, but mainly what it, it wanted to do was to keep the river locked in uh, because there were concerns that if the river ever jumped channels, um, that that would sort of devastate the economies of Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Uh, so at the moment, the Mississippi is locked in its channel uh, because of that Old River Control Structure. Um, and there have been people who have said, you know, maybe we should get rid of it, but you do that, you have all kinds of problems with flooding, and um, who knows what would happen in the Chafalaya area if the Mississippi River starts flowing down it. So, um, but it's currently at the moment that the river is locked in, even though it doesn't want to be, uh, it wants oh, to no. meander. And, and so then, yeah, and it becomes a human question. I guess that's where it becomes more political is people's lives and houses and cities are right next to the river. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's that's the reason why the, the Mississippi, or the big reason why the Mississippi has been engineered, mm -hmm. um, is to protect property. Uh, although Congress tried to pretend it was not doing that uh, for a long time, but by the probably 1917, early 1920s, um, Congress had accepted that we're just going to have to uh, to do flood control, um, and so that's this huge engineering project started with the Mississippi, uh, or that's when those engineering projects to the Mississippi River really got started uh, and building thousands and thousands of miles of levees to contain the river to keep it from flooding out all of those areas uh, that it had flooded out in 1913 and again in 1915 and 1917. <laughs> now is there a particular uh, pattern of, of securing this funding? Is it going to Congress and asking the federal government or does did the state try to fix the problem first? You say Louisiana ha doesn't have money to do it. So how did it work? Right. So there's been a couple of different attempts to fund um, to fund coastal restoration. Um, there was a, a trust fund that was set up in the late uh, 18 or I'm sorry, the late 1980s um, that the state uses to help pay um, for coastal restoration projects. And then in the early 1990s, um, Senator Bro, who I mentioned earlier, he got some federal money um, that comes into the state. Uh, but currently, um, so those are sort of two big sources of funding, right? The state trust fund, which they use oil and gas revenues to pay for, um, and then also the BRO Act, um, which also sends money. Um, recently, uh, the last decade or so, uh, sort of the biggest sources of funding have been um, the disaster money from the BP oil spill, mm -hmm. um, settlement from that. Uh, and then also there's a couple of different... Um, acts or, or funds that come off or come out of uh, offshore oil drilling in federal waters. Um, so that's sort of where the state gets its money, that, those, that, that trust fund, the BRO Act, the BP oil spill money, and then these, these other sort of offshore oil drilling 
uh, funds that come to the state. Uh, and it's not enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's not anywhere nearly enough. The only sort of uh, guaranteed sources of funding, I think, after 2030 are um, the state's trust fund. And I think that's it, actually. Uh, maybe one of the, the federal um, money acts. But the BP oil spill money is going to be gone. Um, the BRO Act has to be renewed periodically, so there's no guarantee it'll still be around. Um, and it's it's, you know... It's a lot of money that comes out of the BRO Act, but it's it's also sort of a drop in the bucket compared to what Louisiana actually needs. Now, uh, yeah, you talk a lot about, I mean, your your uh, your dissertation and, and forthcoming publication is is very heavily political. So, like, you know, you're writing on on the the people who have political agency and economic power. These are the the folks that you're talking about quite a lot. Um, do do you find through them voice of like regular people, and how do you get that? Like, you know. yeah, that's a good question. So the the book, when I write it, I have uh, two groups of people, right? I have the policy makers, which are the the politicians and the the state officials and administrators. Um, and then I also have people I like to call policy influencers, mm. and those are journalists. Um, those are everyday people that are working to save the coast, right? They're the people who live in Louisiana. They're the ones that go to the meetings to talk to the state and to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and so there's, especially when it comes to issues of, of social justice and who's going to have to pay the costs for restoration, um, there have been efforts in recent years to increase the influence or increase the um, attention that is paid to people who live there, right, to listen to them, to use their local knowledge, um, and to respect um, their needs and their ideas for repairing the coast. So um, it's, a, it's a group effort, I guess, um, in terms of who's influencing this, but certainly the people with the money um, sort of have ultimately the final say because you have to pay for all of it. Yeah, and and so I, I to me I find that kind of fascinating, and maybe that's like a bright spot if if the people can influence sort of the journalists or even the local politicians to speak up more. It does make change. You've seen it make change. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you're if you're living in Plaquemine Parish or St. Bernard Parish, you're you're seeing you know erosion firsthand, and of course you're calling your representatives, um, and you're you're talking to them and, and pressuring them. So um, the influence of, of local people and local concerns um, is absolutely important. Um, it, it is vital to what's going on. Uh, but their influence is limited to the extent that somebody can pay uh, for what they're asking. And also, they're, you know, they come up against other things, other interests as well. I mean, the oil and gas industry is a double-edged sword for Louisiana. It brings a lot of jobs, a lot of money, but it's also contributed to a lot of environmental damage. So um, all of those factors sort of play out and it gets complicated and complex. Mm -hmm. And can we talk a little bit about the jobs? So you have these people working on, um, you know, oil rigs, BP and that kind of thing in the whole industry, Shell or whatever, um, all these companies in Louisiana and, and Texas. Um, uh, who else do you have? What other industries are there that are, that are affected but maybe not so powerful? Um, so the the shrimper industry and the the uh, oyster fishers and the, the the whole fishing industry that's it's a pretty powerful um, or significant chunk of change in Louisiana. Um, Louisiana provides a lot of fish, um, a lot of commercial landings for the the entire country. Um, so while they do not have the billions of dollars that the oil and the gas industry does, the, the petrochemical industries do, um, it's still it's still influential. It's still powerful. Um, and then you know, also you have recreation, right? People like to go down to, to Louisiana. It's the sportsman's hmm. paradise. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, so those industries are, are affected as well. Um, but the big ones you have, um, and oil and gas is not nearly as, as powerful as it was in the 60s and 70s, um, but it's still a big influence. And so are the petrochemical industries um, that, that exist between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, so they're there. You know, you've got the recreation. You've got the fishers. Um, of course, then, you know, the hospitality industry in New Orleans, that's another powerful interest um, that you're dealing with in, in Louisiana. So lots of different people are down there, um, and they all use the coast differently, um, and sometimes those uses conflict with one another. Hey there, Hour of History podcast listeners. Have you seen our website, hourofhistory.com? It has some excellent content that has aged very well. 
discussions about places such as Syria, North Korea, and the United States still relevant today, even though the podcast was recorded nearly a year ago. Check out hourofhistory.com and scroll for a bit. Stay for a while, and you won't regret it. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. And yeah, and Louisiana is certainly, um, it's, it's always sort of had a, a national reputation as, as a kind of unique, you know, whether, you know, it's, it's law and the Napoleonic code or, or just the feel of New Orleans, it, it has had a, a sort of intrigue to the rest of the United States. Um, can you talk a little bit about regulation, maybe for one of these different groups? How, how has the state tried to regulate the use of these, these wetlands? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that the state goes, actually there are lots of different ways that the state goes about um, trying to regulate the use of regulation, or u regulate the use of the coast. Um, and it's evolved over time. Um, in the 1970s, sort of in line what was going on with the rest of the nation, um, Louisiana was really looking at conservation methods, right? That idea that you can use um, natural resources, um, they can fulfill lots of different functions, um, you just have to be smart about how you use it, right? You have to conserve it so that um, the, the resource sticks around long enough for people in the future. Um, and so whatever regulations were put into place were meant to do that, right? To sort of allow the oil and gas industry, to allow the shrimpers, to allow um, shipping and navigation to, to continue to use the coast. Um, but they had to be careful about how they were doing it. Um, and one of the ways that the state and also eventually the federal government um, went about doing that is they inter introduced something called coastal use permits. Um, you have to get a, a permit from the state and also a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers if you want to do anything um, that might affect the wetlands. Uh, and basically that's just, you know, if you're a company, you go in, or if you're a private landowner, you want to you do something that might impact the wetlands, um, you have to fill out paperwork and go through these agencies, um, and they have to then approve um, the use or approve whatever it is you're going to do. Um, that helps some um, in terms of reducing losses. Um, the oil bust in the 1980s probably had more of an impact than the coastal use permits did. Um, but those are still around. Uh, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, you still have to, to receive approval from the Army Corps of Engineers. You still have to get approval from the state. Um, that, has, that is one way that the state goes about trying to um, control what people do on the coast. Uh, another way um, that, that the state and the federal government have approached um, trying to protect the coast has with just been preservation, um, setting aside swaths of land that can't be developed. Um, there's this really great uh, national wildlife refuge near New Orleans called Bayou Sauvage, um, and it's this huge, it's like 20,000 acres or something of protected land, um, and you can't develop in there, you can't do anything in there except go and enjoy nature. Um, mm. So that's another way that, that the state and the federal government have tried to um, protect or conserve land. And, and then probably the other third one is restoring the coast, right? Just building wetlands where, um, or, or shoring up wetlands that are in danger of sinking. So that's probably another way um, that the state has gone about trying to address the issue or trying to control what's happening. And is, is uh, for, well, first I want to ask about shoring up the coast uh, and then we'll get back to this preservation and conservation, but, but uh, so that's possible. You can rebuild wetland? Yeah, so it depends. I mean, it's, there, there are some areas in the coast that are, that are repairing them or restoring them. It would be um, prohibit. it would be cost prohibitive. It would just cost too much money. Um, but further inland, where you still have wetlands and you still have marsh and the saltwater intrusion isn't quite as bad, um, yeah, you can absolutely rebuild them. They have freshwater diversions that bring fresh water and sediments into areas, and over enough time, um, those build up. Uh, you have people that will plant vegetation. Um, they'll actually go out and plant uh, swaths of, of grasses and things to help them sort of take, um, take root. And then um, this is one of my favorite things that the state has done. Um, starting in the 1990s, they would have people donate their Christmas trees um, yes. and they would take Christmas trees down into the, into the marshes and, and the wetlands and they would build fences basically um, that would trap sediment. So instead of it getting washed out into the Gulf, it would stop at these sort of Christmas tree lines. Um, I think in the 1997, uh, the White House actually donated all of its Christmas trees to, to the cause. Um, so wow. yeah, that's, um, that's been going on for years. People will 
go out and donate their Christmas tree. So um, that's. So it is possible to rebuild. Um, and then these other terms, preservation and, and conservation, um, and th they sound like really nice and they sound great. Um, but, it, but is it just like, you know, <laughs> trying to plug up a dam with a toothpick? Like, uh, <laughs> so we said we were going to get to pressing and we are. Yeah. Uh, that didn't take long. How long was that? About yeah, I know. We're going to have to. Yeah. Um, so uh, concert, the, the, the approach approaches of conservation and preservation, um, uh, those are different approaches that people have taken to handling the environment in the United States really since the late 19th century. Um, and so conservation, the idea is that you still use the land, you just use it smartly in a way that, you know, the most good for the most people for the longest period of time. Preservation is, is setting it aside, right, so that people can't use it at all and it remains as it, as it was or theoretically as it was, you know, pristine nature. Mm. Um, and so, you know, there, there's been conservation was really sort of what won out in the United States from the early 20th century until after after the end of, of World War II, um, and since then we've seen sort of a mixed bag of of conservationist approaches, um, regulating the land, making sure that it's still are natural resources, and then also preserving the land. Right, that's how we have the national park system, mm -hmm. um, sort of preserving, setting off those sides. Um, but of course, people still use the national parks to. Um, you know, get timber and oil and gas and more so in recent years. Um, so yeah, those, those two approaches and that's what Louisiana has, has done. It's, it's taken sort of a conservationist approach and also a preservationist approach um, in the seventies, eighties and nineties and two thousands. And so, so the trend, I mean, the, you started with those, those big statistics that are really scary, the yeah. 1800 square miles of land. Um, but it's but it's so so it it, it do, do we need a more radical plan if if you were living in new orleans right now would would you be you know worried enough to to want to be like radically changing government or something um i would be scared <laughs> enough um i don't think most people are because most people don't think about that you know they go about their lives and um they don't you know necessarily contemplate uh, that sort of apocalyptic environmentalism of the 70s isn't really with us anymore, although that may change with climate change. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, people go about their lives. Um, and so, you know, we have a tendency to get complacent. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, things a lot of times don't change until there's some sort of big disaster. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens the next big storm that comes and, and knocks down New Orleans because um, it'll happen eventually. Um, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the radical environmental approach, um, has not really ever been something, I, I think probably one of the most radical environmental pieces of environmental legis legislation that our country has ever passed was the Endangered Species Act. Um, and since then we've been pretty conservative about, um, about the environment, um, because you run into all those issues of the economy and private land use and, you know, it gets sort of complicated and, um, we might need a, a radical approach um, in Louisiana, but I, I don't know that it'll happen until something really awful occurs. Yeah, and it sounds like there's, so these wake up calls, uh, like the, these huge disasters like Katrina, um, do kind of serve to at least temporarily make people quote, throw around like radical ideas. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how those have changed policy or economics? Maybe we can start with Katrina. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, in my dissertation and then also in the book that I'm working on, um, I make, make the argument that Katrina is the catalyst for really changing the way the state and the federal government deal with coastal erosion in Louisiana uh, because it was such a devastating event. Um, and what happened prior to Katrina, um, the state – had made some efforts, but there wasn't, it, the policymaking had been really piecemeal. Um, there wasn't a single vision for the coast. Um, you had all these different agencies that are involved in the coast and regulating the coast. Uh, sometimes they're working together, sometimes they're not. Um, and then you add the federal government into that. So it was, it was sort of a mess. Um, and, you know, people down there, right, journalists and researchers um, were saying we really need to, to have a unified vision for the coast. 
Um, in fact, they uh, there was a, a report put out in 1998 talking about, you know, Coast 2050, right? Let's get this mm. unified vision for the coast. <laughs> um, but in terms of actually implementing um, more unified policy, having a single agency to oversee all age, uh, activities on the coast, um, that didn't happen until after Katrina. Um, in 2005, the state passed a new law um, that created the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, and now they are the guys that are in charge, um, mm -hmm. the men and women in charge of overseeing the coast. And so they serve as sort of a point, uh, as point persons uh, for overseeing the coast. So that was a huge um, change in terms of how the state was going to go about um, managing the coast. Uh, and then also after Katrina, this idea of preserving the coast, preserving the wetlands, uh, for its economic value, for its um, sort of recreational value, got linked very strongly um, with the idea of, of defense, right, of, of coastal defense and protecting against things like storm surge. Um, so, you know, this sustainable coast, it's not just good for the economy, it's also good, um, you know, for protecting lives, mm -hmm. right? The, the wetlands save lives, um, or mm -hmm. they, 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 they help mitigate storms so they're not as devastating. Yeah, and and the storm is then you know a huge issue, and and storms continue and continue and continue to to hit you know especially basically any place in the Caribbean, all over the world. But but not only nature causes these catastrophes, but also humans. And so the BP oil spill was another kind of moment. How did that change uh, policy? Yeah, uh, so that's that's a great question. Yeah, uh, Ted Steinberg, um, he he wrote Acts of God. He makes that argument that, and and not just him, lots of uh, other historians make that argument that um, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. Mm. There are environmental events, and then the disaster comes in um, when you know that environmental event, like a hurricane, comes in contact with human society, um, and human society is usually the one that makes it bad. <laughs> the way we go about building things and and where we decide right. to live. Um, so the the BP oil spill. We're getting a little bit out of um, out of my uh, I, I, my research stops pretty much in 2007, um, but the BP oil spill, of course, um, it, probably the biggest impact that it had in terms of coastal restoration was that it brought in a lot of money, mm. um, a lot of fines, Clean Water Act fines, um, other fines that were levied on BP. Um, that's where a huge, significant chunk of funding is coming in. Um, in terms of offshore oil drilling, the Obama administration tried to um, sort of implement, uh, they implemented a moratorium for a while. There was some talk about um, making oil, offshore oil drilling more stringent, um, introducing new regulations, but um, that has somewhat fallen by the wayside in recent years. Um, the current administration is much more friendly towards offshore oil drilling um, than the Obama administration was, and they were pretty friendly too. So, right. I don't imagine as long as there's the demand with the consumers and all these people with the jobs, I, I can't really imagine it changing. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that you know renewable energy advocates sort of run up against, uh, and bang their heads against the wall. Is that you know, and that's one of the greatest sources of of post World War II American wealth and and our high standard of living is that we have had cheap energy. Um, we have access to cheap oil, cheap natural gas. It has allowed us to build cities like Los Angeles where you can drive everywhere. Um, and it helps us make stuff. I mean, we have a really good quality of life in the United States because of our access to cheap energy. Um, and so overcoming that um, is difficult mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, people, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. We like convenience. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I feel bad every time I order something from Amazon, you know, and they ship me five different boxes, you know, like. But we can't stop ourselves, can we? It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, and, and, you know, you also you run into issues of scale, right? I mean, if you get 10,000 people who, who don't, you know, necessarily order five boxes from Amazon, that's great. But, you know, the, the sort of changes that we need to actually combat climate change or even something like coastal erosion with Louisiana, you really need the government to come in. Uh, because as humans, mm. we, we tend to do what's easy, we tend to do what's convenient, um, and so we almost sort of need someone to tell us no. Um, you can't do that. Right, but it's a, and it's kind of that, that's where the trouble is because the government is composed of 
us. <laughs> right. So then the government's made up of us, and the government also has to listen to people who don't want them to do things um, that might cost them money. So um, that's um, <clears throat> that's one of the, the, the most frustrating things about being an environmental historian um, mm. and, and watching sort of, you know, these – events unfold slowly over time and, and you can see what's going to happen and how bad it's going to be, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I wanted to ask about environmental history's uh, sort of role in in both, you know, what is environmental history trying to do to become more more prominent and what can it do? Can it really affect change? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, so environmental history is a subfield of history. Well, as we think of it today, got it started in the 60s and 70s. And it's really been, I think, a distinctive field since the 1980s. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't get a lot of play. Uh, I, 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 you know, I've been in, I can't tell you how many um, survey, American survey courses I've had in. And people very rarely talk about the environment, if at all. Um, and then you read American history textbooks, and it's sort of like, you know, you'll go through this whole chapter. And it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, the environment. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I think, you know, people, I, I don't know. I don't know why people are more interested in it. Maybe because we don't talk about it, you know, in a way that is compelling. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I think, you know, I'm interested to see what happens over the next decade or so, especially as climate change really begins to affect people's lives um, and affects their jobs and the economy. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens as we sort of confront those, you know, big storms that, you know, are weird now, but they become more and more commonplace. You know, do people turn to history to sort of see how things have been handled in the past? Um, and as far as environmental historians go, um, you know, I we should talk more to our colleagues about teaching it in general survey classes. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever encountered a, a general environmental history. Like, it's always been um, sort of... Uh, you know, put into the uh, scope of geography or, or something, you know, like it'll never just be just an environmental history. It'll be like, I don't know, it, it becomes more and more niche. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate because there are universities that do offer environmental history courses, um, but I think it should be, and I might be biased here, but I think it should be a general <laughs> survey course, just like American history or Western civilization or world history. Um, it should be available for people to take um, so that they can learn because this is, you know, a really important part of our world, especially, again, you know, as we confront climate change. Well, is this sort of a symptom of the, the split between the sciences and, and the liberal arts? How, how much, um, you know, I find a lot of the environmental warnings are coming from, like, the geography department. Yes. Yeah, so there's a, a historian, or a, a, a historical geographer, um, I hope I got his specialization right if he ever says this, uh, his name's Craig Colton. Uh, he's, he's a geographer, but he does a lot of history, and he talks about that sort of thing, about, um, he's written lots of great books about New Orleans, and um, talks about, you know, the, the environment and geography, and sort of melds that together, but yeah, absolutely, I mean, you, you cannot really do good environmental history without at least at some point running into the natural sciences. Um, when I started out my dissertation, I had no idea what a, what a what the amount of information I would read about hydrology was. <laughs> hydrology and geology, and you know, looking at how the wetlands or Louisiana's wetlands were formed versus the Everglades. Um, so, I mean, if you're if you're in environmental history and you're really doing just about anything, you're going to run into the natural sciences. So we like to pride ourselves on being sort of a bridge between the liberal arts and, um, the, you know, the sciences, because we have to sort of draw on both of those things um, to do good history. Mm -hmm. And it seems like anytime you're in a bridge building situation, the, those are some, some of the most difficult spots to be in. So that might be one of the issues w with environmental history. Yeah, because I mean, if you're doing an environmental history class, I mean, you're going to have to talk about science, right? I mean, pretty much yeah. anything. If you were to talk about the natural environment and how it works, and you talk about chemicals, you talk about urbanization, you talk about disease, um, at some point you have to draw on the science, right? So people can really understand what's happening, especially if you're getting into policy, right? And, and what policies are intended to do versus what they actually do. Which, which is kind of interesting because it seems like the people, you know, who are at the forefront of these things um, 
there's a wide, such a wide range, but I'm not, I'm not sure I see a uniform approach. So like after Katrina, you know, a lot of scientists were writing in and saying, you know, either we should fix the levees this way or blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and, and it seems like a different approach. Is there a uniform front or do you find in the, in your study of how policy is formed that it's just been like different voices coming at different angles? Um, so there's always lots of, of different, there, there are lots of different voices about, about what emphasis, what policy should emphasize um, and how to go about fixing the problem. Do you focus on um, like marsh building? Do you focus on the freshwater diversions? Do you focus on, um, you know, do you focus on uh, just regulation? Um, just not hmm. trying to really do anything. Uh, what has sort of won out in the last probably maybe five, 10 years is, learning to work with the natural systems that already exist on the coast. Um, instead of trying to engineer them and control them, work with them. Um, things like freshwater diversions um, mimic natural processes that take place in the delta. Um, so I think in that case, you know, what eventually wins out, uh, one, is always a matter of cost, um, yeah. how feasible it is to pay for something, but also science. Um, the, the the very smart people in Louisiana um, have gotten have gotten a lot better, especially with computer modeling, at being able to um, sort of better predict what what might happen, um, mm -hmm. and so that helps. You know, being able to use these computer models and sort of play things out over 10, 20, 30, 50 years, um, so that helps. So the science improving, um, I think, influences what's getting decided. Hmm. And and the scientists and uh, historians. I, I'm not, I can't really speak for scientists, but historians and especially like the way I approach history is from a, a global sort of perspective. Now, Louisiana, the coastline looks a lot like uh, Bengal in India. It looks like Amsterdam or the Netherlands, you know, these low lying areas that face a lot of similar problems. Did you find uh, much international interaction or did most Louisianians stick to Louisiana? No, yeah, that's a great question. There's actually been a lot of exchange between the Netherlands and Louisiana. Um, I think at least several times professors from Louisiana State University have gone to the Netherlands um, to see what they do and to see how they influence. And I think people from the Netherlands, um, experts from the Netherlands have come over to you to help. Um, but yeah, there is definitely an exchange between um, Louisiana and the Netherlands and what's going on. Because you're right, they're, they're, their situations are, are pretty similar uh, in terms of what to do and how to handle um, areas that flood. Mm -hmm. And the cost issue though, for Louisiana and Netherlands, that makes sense. But you look at places like um, Bengal and, and Southeast Asia, and it kind of seems like, and they have uh, a much bigger population centers very close to the coast as well. Um, it seems like Louisiana could become a kind of global leader if they start to figure things out. Yeah, I, I make that uh, that argument, and I've, I've made that argument in a couple of papers I've written and a couple of blog articles I've done, too, that, um, you know, the, the problems that New Orleans is facing and, and other sort of low-lying populations in southern Louisiana, that story is going to play out over and over again across the world, um, especially in the next 15 years as sea levels rise, or 15, 50 years as sea levels rise. Um, and if Louisiana can sort of, you know, really start to figure out how to handle that, um, how to handle sustainability and resilience, um, then that knowledge can then be disseminated, you know, through other, to other areas that are, are facing those same sort of problems. Yeah, that would be really fantastic if it could work out that way. Um, I have to ask you about food because <laughs> it's important. I remember going to the Chimes and getting 20 cent Tuesday oysters, which yes. I'm sure is not a thing anymore. I don't think it's a thing. They still have oysters, but it's not 20 cents on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and just take them by the plate after plate. And then, you know, this is pre-oil spill and everything. So the oyster the Chimes were good and we lived recklessly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Sounds like New Orleans and Louisiana. <laughs> exactly, Louisiana in a nutshell. Is there a sustainability issue with the way we consume food? Uh, Louisiana provides most of the seafood for the United States, right? Yeah, it provides a lot. Um, th that's, that's an issue. Uh, that's one of the things that oyster ish or fishers have faced, particularly with um, dealing with coastal restoration and then also the beetroot oil spill and how those 
two things have affected supplies. Um, as far as sustainability goes, uh, you know, that's an open question because as the Gulf of Mexico creeps further and further inland, all of these sort of freshwater or brackish areas where um, these things that we like to eat live, mm -hmm. um, their habitats become disrupted and then eventually are um, sort of made uninhabitable. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know that it's a problem in the immediate future. You can probably still enjoy your oysters for a, <laughs> a little bit to come. Um, but eventually over the long run, yeah, I mean, you know, the oyster industry has steadily been moving inland since I think at least the 50s um, because, uh -huh. you know, the, the water, is, you know, oysters require very specific salinity regime. Um, and so as the Gulf of Mexico, as you get that saltwater intrusion coming in, it changes where they live and they can't move, they can't migrate because they're sessile. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, it, in the future, issues of food sustainability may become another problem to deal with. Mm -hmm. Another issue of, and, and so they're moving. Well, that's kind of what happens, right? Everything start to move to where it is more hospitable, but humans seem to be particularly bad at that. Yeah, so uh, some places, um, so there's a, 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 um, a geographer by the name of Scott Hermeling. He's, I, I just uh, co-authored a chapter with him and an, uh, another one of our, uh, his colleagues. Um, he did this really great study about looking at migration from in, on the coast, um, and he looked at um, post, post offices. Um, and he's been able to track inland migration from the coast over the last, I think, several decades by looking at post offices that closed. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so people are sort of steadily moving inland um, because they don't, you know, they can't stay anymore, right? Their, their homes are, you know, flooding, their roads are flooding. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it's, it's been more of a slower process, um, you know, in the last several decades that might increase, um, you know, again, as sea levels rise. And, well, yeah, so that's, um, it's fascinating to sort of think about these kind of things. And that brings us back to kind of the map. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the map of Louisiana is a lie. You know, we kind of know that nice shape of the boot with all those veins going out into the um, Gulf. It, it, I haven't checked, actually, I, shortly after we're done with this conversation, I'm going to go on to Google Earth and see what the satellites show. But um, you, do you think that would be a helpful step? to sort of like redraw and spend time with maps and things like that? Yeah, I, well, I think so the, the state and then also I think the geological survey, the U.S. Geological Survey has done some really great maps to show you mm -hmm. um, that the, the boot is now a lie. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you can go online and you can find these, these images um, and the, there, there's some really great ones. Um, that sort of highlight what's going to be lost in the next 50 years in red. And it is terrifying oh, wow. um, to, to look at what the state stands to lose. Um, so, yeah, you could absolutely go on and, and, um, and post those or, or look at those and, and sort of see them. And, I, you know, if I had lots of money, I would plaster them everywhere <laughs> <laughs> um, so that people could see them and see what's happening and, and what the state and the nation stands to lose in the next 50 years. Yeah, and I also think, like, yeah, just – people seeing Louisiana, I mean, once it, it's, it's one thing to like know Louisiana exists, but once you go there and, and do actually see the beauty, it's, it's extraordinarily beautiful place. It is. Um, I have, I was in, I was in Baton Rouge for 10 years working on my, my PhD. And then after graduation, I absolutely love Louisiana. Uh, and Louisiana is not just New Orleans friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. There are lots of great things in the Northern part of the state as well, including Poverty Point. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a wonderful state and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and if you ever get the chance to go, you should absolutely go. You should absolutely eat. Um, some of the best food in the nation is in Louisiana. Yeah, this is, well, this is actually a nice segue as, as the hour draws near, um, always goes by so fast, but, um, the, we finish, you know, the, we finish the episode with suggestions, uh, before we get to suggestions, do you have anything else that you wanted to say before we sort of get to the last stages of the podcast? Is there anything that we didn't come across that you thought you should mention? Uh, no, I think you did a great job covering everything. All uh, right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, job well done. Um, oh, so something just talking sort of broad, more broadly about environmental history and, and, you know, getting it out to people and having people sort of sort of 
absorb it more into their lives. Um, there's this really fantastic blog that has been started recently. Um, it's called Environmental History Now. Uh, it's run by a uh, doctoral candidate out of Boston University. Her name, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced this, Elizabeth. Uh, it's Elizabeth Hamidaman. I think that's right. All right. <laughs> But she has Dutch. a fantastic blog. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a really great blog, and I'm so sorry if I if I got your name wrong, Elizabeth. Um, but it's a really great blog. You can you can Google it. It's Environmental History Now. Um, they they're on Twitter as well. So um, definitely check that out. Get more environmental history into your life. Awesome. Well, the, so you just skipped right into it, the suggestion. Um. Well, it was a suggestion that I wanted people to know. So. Oh. Do you have an additional suggestion? Because we usually close out the show with a suggestion. It could be anything. But that sounds like a great one. Do you have more? Yeah, I'm sure you have more. Is there? I, any? I have lots of suggestions. <laughs> How much time do we have left? Um, does it have to be related to history, or, or can it be like a um, no, a, requ a request for something? No, there's no. There are no rules. No what? No. no rules to the podcast. To just yeah, we once had a banana and avocado shake. Uh, I don't. I don't know what to do with this anarchy. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So I thought about this recently um, when I was going into the gym. I need someone, whoever you are out there listening, um, if you have an interest <laughs> in environmental history and also building apps for mobile phones, um, I need an app that plays a theme song every time I walk into a different room. Uh, like a, so uh, you can become your own movie hero. Exactly. So when I go into the gym, I want Eye of the Tiger. When I go into <laughs> when I go into the classroom for the first day, I went O Fortuna. So, and uh, <laughs> but then it would. The, the, this is the scary thing about this. But then it would have to know what room you're in at all times. I well, I think Google knows where we are at all times. They do yeah. indeed. Yeah, okay, it's <laughs> already it's it's already been spent. You yeah, know, I'll put that appeal out in the show notes. Um, I will also link to envir his, environmental history now as well as. Um, some of those other names and, and works that you mentioned so awesome. people can read those. My suggestion is a book um, written by Amitav Ghosh. So I started in South Asian history and Amitav Ghosh, you know, he does a fantastic job of bringing literature and history together. And he's recently turned his uh, attention to, to climate change. And he wrote a book just recently called The Great Derangement. Ooh, um, check that out. Yeah, it's about he, the subtitle climate change and the unthinkable and it's, it's a cultural analysis. So I, I, it probably pairs very well with your work, which is economic and political. This is looking at sort of um, how people push aside, you know, well, I'm just living my life, so I don't have to worry about this. Mm -hmm. How the, it's the individual, and we kind of talked about it in the podcast, where it's the individual here who's, who's not responsible, and, and because we don't really have that sort of collective um, yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Ooh, so, that sounds really great. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, and we will absolutely link to that in the podcast. Uh, notes at hourofhistory.com. And we always have recommendations at hourofhistory.com forward slash Rex. Um, well, it's been delightful, Dr. Bond, Dr. Rebecca Bond, uh, teaching us about the environment. Thank you so much for joining us on Hour of History. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a thoroughly enjoyable, uh, thoroughly enjoyable hour. Thank you very much. Uh, on Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. See ya. Thanks again for listening. Make sure to check out OurHistory.com forward slash Rex for all the recommendations mentioned during the show. That's OurHistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, be sure to head over to our blog at OurHistory.com forward slash blog where you'll find topics that were covered in the podcast as well as others. And that concludes this week's episode. We thank you again for listening and we hope to have you back here next week at the Hour of History podcast. Hey, Hour of History podcast fans, have you checked out the Hour of History blog, hourofhistory.com forward slash blog, updated twice a month with new content talking about the trials and tribulations of becoming a historian, as well as some great suggestions for books, movies, and just about everything else under the sun, hourofhistory.com forward slash blog. Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place.